at least for the time that I spent slaving over a hot co uh, code. So this was a lot of a simple code, but a lot of work uh, refining it. Okay, as uh, he said, this is open source security orchestration. My name is uh, Gregory Pickett with Hellfire Security. I am part of the Cybersecurity Operations Group and have been for some time. Overview of today's talk, we'll start with how this all began, followed by orchestrating all the things. Next is uh, Behold Skynet, or what we're kind of building here, and then making it better. And finally, wrapping up, final thoughts, where to get a &P, uh, links to learn more about security orchestration. Okay, let's start then with how this all began. Okay. It started with a question, all right? Multiple cloud servers, all using fail the ban to protect themselves. Can I share, uh, share a jail between these systems? But in security operations, this leads to lots of other questions as well. How do we get to threats in time? All right. How do we make sure that the evidence gets captured in the event we, ha uh, in the event we have identified a threat? How do we make sure that the threat is stopped before it's too late? And then how do we do this all with a limited staff? Now these questions are because of the way that security operations currently works. We monitor the enterprise, process alerts. If we have a big boy shop, we'll have a SIM and be looking at correlations. And in the event that we identify a a genuine threat, we kick off incident response. And despite a multitude of solutions, this is still very much a manual process. Each solution is kicked off in sequence by us. As it currently stands, if I have a system, someone fails to log on multiple times, an address is jailed. If I want to jail that also on another system, running failed ban, it's a very manual process. If uh, IPS kicks off an alert, we have to go to the council, we have to take a look at it. In the event we uh, identify a genuine threat, we then have to go to the switch, we have to start a capture. We find something uh, interesting, they were successful, then we want to uh, log into the antivirus, the endpoint protection uh, product council, and we have to maybe instruct it to delete files, kill a process. So all of this is very manual, uh, manual work. A lot of time then is being wasted, uh, being a bridge between these systems. Okay. So as an operations person, I think as a human being, what I want is ultimately all these solutions to keep doing what they're currently doing and to directly talk to each other, to get what they need from each other all right, and leave me out of it. I would like these things just to talk to one another. IPS talk to the switch, switch talk to the endpoint protection, and they get things done. That's what I would like and what inspired this. Okay. So how would this work? Right. Sharing events. So an attacker fails multiple logons. Server A jails the attacker address. Server A shares those events with server B, and then server B jails the attacker address. Very simple use case. But there are other use cases. So let's take a look at other use cases for sharing events. We want to do more than just, ultimately, we want to do more than just uh, right, share or fail to ban jail. Okay. Generate threat intelligence feed. Events shared between peers could be used to generate a blacklist. And then you can use, uh, use that with anything that can consume a blacklist. Firewalls, endpoint solutions, detection tools. You could uh, share the blacklist with vendors, partners, colleagues. Lots of uses for that. Firewall rule propagation. Host firewalls, network firewalls can receive events from peers and, of course, block the threat, uh, right, the source of the threat events. And then distribute events among peers so that other host firewalls, network firewalls, can then block the threats that that firewall has seen. Drop propagation, drop source of threat events. 
web application firewalls, intrusion prevention systems can distribute events among peers so that events that they have seen, threats that they've dropped, other web application firewalls, other IPSs can then also drop that threat. Prevent known threats. Host firewalls, network firewalls, receiving events, right, shared amongst peers, actually shared uh, with an external third party can block sources of threat events. Lots of publicly available threat feeds. Net to honeypot. Host firewalls, network firewalls can receive events from peers and then redirect the source of the threat away from your assets. Right? Net it to a honeypot. Host firewalls, network firewalls can receive events from peers and optionally uh, slow down the source of a threat by netting that threat to Tarpit, or any number of variations that seem to have sprung up over the years. Capture threat activity. Switches, routers, firewalls can receive events from peers and run, then run a packet capture on the source of the threat activity. Inject beacon. FTP servers, file servers, honeypots can receive events from peers and then drop a beacon in the path of this uh, source of threat activity. Right? It would be very nice if they would open that file, then run it, and then we'd know where they are at. Redirect traffic. Routers, firewalls can receive events from peers, change the route for the source of the threat activity, bring it through uh, an alternate segment, one with additional sensors, you get a closer look, and of course the traffic would then just continue on to its normal destination. Reporting threats. An email server could receive events from peers and then report the source of the threat to the abuse address. Okay. Host isolation. Switches, routers, firewalls can receive events from peers and then apply an ACL, a bit different, to the target of threat activity. Additional logging. Switch, router, firewall, server, maybe an application can receive events from peers and turn on verbose logging for the source of, of the threat activity or could alternately also or together verbose logging for the target a threat activity to get a closer look at what actually happened after the threat activity occurred. And tr final one, trigger password resets. LDAP, Active Directory, Radius, TACX can receive events from peers and then start a password reset process for the target of threat activity, let's say for web server, right, web server accounts. Yeah. So we're talking about, right, in a very simple uh, sense is security orchestration, or what I like to think of as machine-to-machine uh, -machine orchestration. And this is how we're going to do it. Adapted, uh, adaptive network protocol developed this uh, to share events between systems in a very common format, very simple format. Events are stored locally, and then peers can make use of the shared events how they see fit. Fail the ban can block the threat, Mod security can block the threat. IP tables can do natting. It can nat it to a honeypot. It can nat it to a tarp. It can do any number of things. Yeah. So how this would work in the original scenario. Fail the ban events are pushed into AMP. AMP sends those events to peers. AMP, of course, accumulates those events and at some point in time ages them out. Right? Ages out expired events because a threat today is not necessarily a threat tomorrow. Server B would, uh, A&P would receive the events from peers. A&P would, of course, locally accumulate those events. And then those events would be pulled into fail to ban uh, by A&P so that fail to ban could then jail that address, right, block that threat. And there would also be aging there as well. Okay. Protocol. Sharing for local peers is multicast. Pretty simple. Unicast to remote peers. There are two types of messages right now, add threat event and remove threat event. That's what's currently implemented. Okay. The operation sending and receiving uh, with local peers on UDP port 15,000. I don't think that was taken on that uh, long list of ports. That's the multicast. Received from remote peers on TCP port 15,000. And this is uh, about security, so the message is signed with a SHA-256 signature. Some rules. The signature must be a known good signature. I do believe we actually check that first. 
Uh, if it's already known, do not share about it. Uh, do not share it. If I know about it, so does everybody else. Let's not duplicate our efforts. And do not reflect back to the source. We don't want anything akin to a broadcast storm. Okay. The packet there, version is one byte. It is a binary protocol. Type is one byte. The event that's being shared is a variable size. Signature is 64 bytes. It's very signature heavy right now. Mostly signature. On the wire there, in Wireshark, we have pointers. Uh, we have the version of ANP, message type, the event, very short events, and then the signature. Okay. The messages we have here, we have the add thread event being carried by it, the remove thread event. There are five bytes each. Address is four bytes, time to live, one byte. Let's look at some peering that you can do. Local on the same segment, like on a perimeter. Remote on the same network across the same location. Right, you want to get past uh, the broadcast domain across the layer three boundary there if your router does not propagate multicast. Across different locations, HQ to branch office, link up cloud resources. Uh, most routers aren't set up to propagate multicast, so you would be remote peering within the cloud or between clouds. And of course, different networks. If you want to share events with a, with a vendor, or if you are a vendor, you want to share events with a customer. Any trusted partners, government institutions, probably a dirty word right now, but you can, uh, of course, do that. You can also show, uh, share with individuals. I can do communities, different networks. Pretty simple examples here at HQ. We have local peers sharing events amongst themselves. We have multiple locations. We have an HQ sharing with lo among uh, local peers, a remote site sharing among local peers, and then a remote peering between the two to propagate between locations right, to form a larger federation. It's two-way. Trusted partner vendor. We have an HQ, local peers, a vendor, local peers, and then a one-way. Remote peering to propagate events, but only in one direction, from the vendor to, uh, to you, the customer. All right, we have varying degrees of trust with uh, different organizations. Cloud assets, we have remote peering within an Amazon cloud, and actually the demo is very much like this. Remote peers within the Amazon cloud, we have remote peers in the Azure cloud, all remotely peered there, and then, of course, a two-way remote peering between uh, the clouds to propagate events, and once again, a bit of a federation there. So there's lots of different possibilities, including communities, right? Members of a community, individuals, we have lots of security researchers here, we have lots of hobbyists, we have people uh, in the present profession, and not necessarily can you do this at your office, but you wanna go ahead and share events between individual systems, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. You don't have to do a full mesh, I don't think uh, mesh is used very, very often, it's more of a hybrid where you have maybe two uplinks. So you have sharing with two out, sharing to another direction, right? Getting in kind of a hybrid network there. So we talked about use cases for sharing events. We talked about uh, the sharing that goes on. Now we need to talk about, of course, how in individual systems make use of those events. And those are done with interfaces. Okay. Purpose of the interface is to publish events to ANP and to pull events from ANP. Now, an interface starts out as a template. We have a variety of components, the supporting components, because they basically speak ANP. And you already set up, you just have to fill in then the reader and the writer, which speak the solution, speak IP tables, speak MindSec, my, uh, speak fail to ban. Okay. The operations are publishing to AMP via the loopback interface, interprocess communication, and then polling uh, from AMP via published lists. We have our same situation uh, as before, but now with a bit more detail for the interfaces. Uh, AMP receives events from peers, it's accumulating them. Uh, the interface will then pull events from AMP so that threats seen by others are blocked by fail, uh, by fail to ban. And the interface is then up pushes events to ANP, so mod second fail to ban events that then are passed 
on to a and for sharing. Okay. Two types of interfaces native. Where we're talking about an integrated solution, which in most open source situations it is. You are able to install their software, typically on a Linux server. So a and is then going to be installed in that same system. It's able to read and write locally. Examples, fail to ban, IP tables, Mozek, any number of other uh, solutions like OSEC. Then there are surrogate interfaces. This is where we talk about using this with closed source solutions, where we have ANP installed on a different system, and it reads and writes to that remote uh, standalone solution. Right? So we have one system that's running it, participating, sharing events, and then it has to then write, read and write remotely to, let's say, an ASA, right, through the API, or a switch, or a router. Okay. Right, same uh, scenario again with the surrogate interface. So in this case, the interface is pulling events uh, from a &P, so the threats seen by others are then blocked by the ASA or possibly added to Honeypot, and then the interface is publishing events to a &P. So the ASA events are passed on to a &P for sharing. Okay. Existing interfaces, right? We already have interfaces for this. We're actually using this already. We have a fail to ban interface. It uh, pulls events. Read thread events from ANP, adds threads to the jail. It will then publish events by writing jail addresses to ANP. Because of ANP aging, this means that threats stay jailed for 24 hours as opposed to typical. I think it's like five minutes originally. Uh, we use it about one hour. Now, at this point in time, given the 24 hours, it's important to note that Mistakes can be reversed. We all fat finger addresses. Uh, we were testing our ModSec installation, and we, you know, we're tuning it a bit, and we make a mistake, and we have an event showing up in the log. We don't necessarily want to have ourselves in. Uh, we don't want our systems responding to us. So uh, there is a tool that allows you to inject a remove threat event, which is actually how we started off with the remove threat event message, uh, so we can take ourselves out of that response. And that, too, does have to be signed to make sure that a threat isn't then, of course, removing themselves. We have a blacklist interface, pulls events, reads threat events from ANP, and then adds the threats to a blacklist. You can distribute that for internal use or external use, detecting, blocking, threat indicator for analysis. ModSec interface publishes uh, events to ANP, writes the attacker address to ANP, uh, pair with IB tables, and you can add an attacker to a honeypot. Speaking of that, we have an IP tables interface. It does pull events from AMP by reading thread events from it, and then adding threads to, uh, from a local web server to a local honeypot. It's good to throw in a high interaction honeypot at your website to log the activity, and good opportunity also for a beacon. This is where things get a little more interesting. Uh, sharing also provides increased visibility. It's important to note that we don't change the enterprise. We're not changing how it functions. We're not changing how fail to ban functions. We're not changing how modsec functions or IB tables. We're letting them all pretty much do the job that they always have done and with the same expectations. What we're doing is giving them greater visibility to do so, right, so that they then have the ability to be proactive. So we have our expanded visibility here where an attacker fails their logins. All right, server A jails the address, server B jails the address, server C jails the address, server D jails the address. Now we have given server D, C, and B an opportunity to be proactive. We increased their visibility, and now they can respond prior to the threat crossing their threshold, right, before it gets there. Give them the opportunity to be proactive. Also with sharing, we see a certain amount of cooperative behavior and the ability for the enterprise uh, to act on its own. If anyone has any experience with the traditional paradigm for security orchestration, there's something called playbooks, which very specifically lays out how this system is going to respond in a particular situation and then what's going to be done next by what other system and so forth. This happens without a playbook. Right? This happens based on the normal, natural behavior of these solutions. They start coordinating, they start acting together to, uh, to make things happen. Okay. First example of some cooperative behavior, 
where we talk about an insider scanning a server, sharing those events. Then the server shares those with server B with a switch, and the switch starts logging that intruder traffic. Okay. Gets a bit more extensive than that. Okay. Let's see how our systems start acting together. Okay. Acting to defend the network. We saw this when we started to use ANP. Okay. So an attacker fails multiple logons on one of our servers. Server jails the address, shares that event with other servers. Every single server and infrastructure will then deny access to the attacker. Web application firewall, NATs that attacker address over to a honeypot. Okay. And that address gets shared with the interface for the blacklist generation. Blacklist is generated, and that is consumed by our threat detection platform. So now all of our customers are immediately notified anytime the attacker visits their network. Okay. Should it happen a different way? If they go ahead and decide to browse the website, maybe attempt a SQL injection, it's picked up, that event is picked up by ModSec, it's shared amongst the other servers, the servers know about it, they then jail that address, it prevents the, the attacker from logging into any of those systems. The IP tables then also having that event shared with it will net the attacker address over to a honeypot. And if it's a, a duplicate ultimately of the website, it should be seamless, shouldn't notice, and they begin browsing, scanning, whatnot, uh, of Honeypot instead. Right? And that address also then gets dumped to a blacklist. Our customers are now notified any time that attacker visits their network. Right? So we also see systems acting to investigate a threat. Right? Insider scans a server, the server shares those events, and uh, through a surrogate, Interface would also share them with these two switches. The first switch logs traffic from the threat source, and the second switch captures traffic from the threat source to the subnet. Right, so these systems acting to investigate a threat. Acting to respond to an incident. A website's defaced, and maybe, maybe you have an OSSEC interface there sharing that event out with other systems shares it with a switch, firewall, LDAP. The first switch there isolates the web server by throwing down an ACL for the target of that threat activity, that web server. Firewall does the same uh, to limit horizontal movement. LDAP receives that event and starts a reset, passive reset process for uh, web server accounts. So, okay. so demonstrations. Uh, I did say that uh, the first scenario we've seen emerge through our use. So we'll take a look at that. We actually have a network, a small little network here. We're going to watch it defend itself. We have system one, A and P1. It's actually in the Amazon cloud, assuming my uplink is good here. It's got AMP running, a couple interfaces there. ANP2 then, it's in the Azure cloud, also running ANP. Right, they're all sharing events here various interfaces. The first one has a fill the ban interface, mod sec. Second one in the Azure cloud has a fill the ban interface, blacklist interface, and then we have the third one in the Azure cloud ha running AP also with the fill the ban interface, mod sec, and IP tables. Hopefully we can see that. Is everyone able to see that? Mm. Now, that third one has the website. I suppose it's open season on this website now. Tempting target. So we are going to attack that first one, we're going to do what we see every single day, right? SSH brute force. And we're going to see that system share those events 
all, all, the, all the other systems and we're going to see how, the, how they start defending themselves. In this particular case, this one is going to start nadding me to a uh, honeypot and we'll see it looks almost identical to this. There's a slight difference so that you can of course see that it is something different. All right, I want to show you how since they are, are already participating in already showing events. I want to show, uh, there we go. So they have, whew, it's getting big. The longer these things stay out here, the more brute forcing we see. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so we see that their failed to ban jails are pretty much synced up. All right, there's some timing issues, obviously. Uh, but the first one has 123 addresses that are currently banned. Second one is 122. Uh, three will have a similar number, right? They originated different points and cascade across, and so you won't have an exact match unless it's very quiet. You can see the second one. I'm in the wrong spot. Okay. Typically with blacklists, we like to just have the addresses. So that's what we have here, and we have that blacklist sitting there that can be consumed by any sort of threat detection platform. Sure. That's easier to see. I can roll this up. So there's that first part. All I'll lose that though. So they are almost identical. And then we have the blacklist that's being generated off of this that can be consumed uh, in any number of ways at infinite almost. It's being generated from that. So let's go ahead and exit from this and this. This is number two. We are going to pound on that first one a little bit. It has been acting up. Failed to ban uh, has not been necessarily banning me. If it should fail again today, I have other ways of pissing that first machine off. Okay, it's got set to five, so we should be through this pretty quickly and know where we stand. One more. Been kind of on and off of that. Oh, it worked. Nope. It does not want to block me. All right, so we're going to try to upset it, piss it off in another way. Let me get one of those addresses. Good old mod sec should be able to help me out here. Okay. We're going to go to that first one again. And non-compliant as far as is concerned. All right, a 403. I did speed up the communication there, sharing a little bit faster than uh, we normally have them sharing, so we should start to see the cascading effect pretty soon. While we are letting those two talk, or those three talks amongst themselves, we will continue and check back toward the end here. Okay. Okay. So as I said, uh, we've seen the first situation emerge. We've seen the self-defending network emerge with our use. There are uh, two other situations that are waiting to emerge. It's waiting for us to make it a bit better. We're talking about additional message types for the add target event and remove target event so we can start doing things like dropping ACLs so we can start seeing uh, basically the use cases from before, start passive resets. It also means more interfaces. All right, LDAP interface, I actually I would like to see an OSIC interface as well pretty quickly. Uh, Cisco ASA interface, 
to do to bring out more of these use cases to allow some of these other situations to emerge. Also, peer groups. Okay, uh, you trust different groups of people, different organizations, to differ to to varying degrees, right? I might trust you completely. We've known each other many many years. Uh, we can go ahead and share the events, all events, maybe. Just met, uh, met this guy. We don't. He doesn't trust you so much. He doesn't want you to see his events. So we have a peer group where we share everything, and then only some things with you. Maybe only things that originate with our organization. So after the establishment of peer groups, there's some sort of filtering to say that we are sharing only. You're sharing. We're uh, just us are sharing. We'd also might see uh, some filtering for rule thread events. Maybe, especially in a vendor relationship, we want, or a partner, we want them to share threat events, but we don't want necessarily want them to have that kind of control, that kind of impact on their network, the ability to remove threats. Right? We want maybe just us doing that. Okay? Another potential use of peer groups is uh, between systems that are going to be involved in any process. Any systems that would normally be involved in investigation, peer them up. Any systems that would normally be involved in incident response, Peer them up. Okay. Future direction, Internet of Things. Okay. Not looking to uh, be a researcher, someone involved in Internet of Things, so much as the opportunity to take a system on a chip, old school Raspberry Pi, put a bunch of circuit interfaces on that, drop that on a remote branch office network at the perimeter and immediately give uh, that network the capability right, to start responding, not having to re-architect the, the environment, not having to re-engineer anything, but just allow uh, them with the system on a chip on this, on this sock to begin participating and decide to do these sorts of things. Also reporting events. This is machine to machine. They are talking amongst themselves. They are acting on their own. I at some point kind of at time want to know exactly what they're up to. Uh, auditors who might want to know what they're up to. So if we had some sort of running audit log or we could take a look every once in a while, maybe troubleshoot a problem, right, run a report, that sort of thing. And export to uh, Sticks and Taxi. Not a big fan of Sticks and Taxi, but it's important that we share, right? not just not among these systems, but also different types of tools so that we can make uh, the most use of this information. Okay. So all my talks have these two you know, obligatory slides, making the difference. All right, first one, machine-to-machine -machine communication solves many problems, though it doesn't have to be the apocalypse. Uh, with it, we can get to the threat on time, we can make sure evidence is captured, and we can make sure that the threat is stopped. Uh, and we can do that with limited staff because the systems are acting on their own. Okay. Final thoughts before we check on those uh, three cloud servers, it's common to kill problems with money and people. Right? Vendors want to come in with a really big, expensive solution. Understanding your problems will mean better results, right? often cheaper uh, results. Enabling synergies like self-defending networks, self-investigating networks, and self-responding networks. Now, before I finish up, I want to check on these systems here. We'll check at the end. There, our third system. That would be really horrible if it didn't kick off. It has not kicked off yet. Well, that one's no longer letting me log on. Try the second one. Okay, so they're talking. Let's try that third one. It's not talking. That's a horrible thing. Okay. Well, let's check in just a second. We have some time. Maybe uh, they'll finally talk to one another during the Q&A. Famous last words are, the demo worked every single time when we were practicing. Okay. 
So where to get ANP? I'm sorry, but it is at SourceForge. I know that uh, it's quite common now for everything to be at GitHub. And I think with more contributors, we would move it to GitHub. But there it is right now, the ANP agent with the SHA-1 hash, should be updated to 256, of course. The interface for blacklists, interface for fail to ban, IP tables, interface, modsec interface, everything's up there. Lots of links. I mentioned traditional security orchestration involves a very, well, different paradigm where we have lots of controller-centric orchestration. Lots of companies doing it. Make sure you have a lot of money when you go there to visit because they're very expensive. Uh, we also have lots of open source, very specific use case orchestration for fail to ban there. We have more information on uh, taxi and sticks. Also said IP tables, very specific use case for it to redirect uh, blocked IPs to a honeypot. That is it. Before we do the q and I'm going to cross my fingers and see this. if this has talked yet. There we go. It has finally spoken. Oh. Isn't there something we're supposed to say about the demo gods? <sighs> Apparently, they are happy. So if you see a bit of a difference right there, All right? that reset password. So we now have those three systems sharing the events, and they've all begun to respond to me, the threat. They've stopped me from logging in. They've probably, by this time, added me to a blacklist so that customers know about my visit, should I attempt to uh, contact any of them. And web servers and their web application firewalls are now starting to net me over to very convincing-looking honeypots so that I can be logged and tracked and possibly given a phone home binary. Okay. All right. Cool. Good. Okay. So that is it. Thank you for coming today. I understand we're doing a Q&A. Okay. Questions? Thank you. It was a lot of work.